Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we're going to get started. I'm Christelle Guedot. I'm the food crop uh, entomologist and extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin Madison. This is part of our uh, webinar series, and I'll share my screen to show you um, what we are talking about as far as the webinar series for grape. This is our cold climate grape grower webinar series that's put together by um, Annie Claude at the University of Minnesota, and then uh, several of us, Leslie Holland, Amaya Tucha, and myself for the University of Wisconsin Madison. And as part of this series that we're going to talk about today, we have two topics that will be covered. Um, the main one is the planning your bird control strategy that Annie Claude from the University of Minnesota will present. And you know Annie really well, so I'm not going to give her a, a big introduction. And if you want to do that after, you can feel free to do so. And then after that presentation, uh, we'll go into um, more of a Q&A for disease and weed, con weed consideration at this time of the year uh, with Leslie Holland and Jed Cahoon from the UW-Madison. Um, if you have any questions along the, the webinar, uh, what we ask is that you save them for the end of the presentation. Of course, we're in, when we're in the Q&A at any point in time, you can just type them in the Q&A or in the um, chat uh, option on your Zoom. So if you kind of move your uh, cursor around, these will appear at the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to see the Q&A and the chat. So feel free to use those. Um, the, we, we are recording this meeting and at, at the end of the meeting, this re, the recording will be available both on the UW-Madison uh, fruit uh, website as well as the University of Minnesota. Um, I think it's small fruit or maybe Annie, you can say that. Here's one for ours for the University of Wisconsin and Annie will put the link for the one for the small fruit farm or something like that from the University of Minnesota. So you have access to those recordings uh, probably by tomorrow and you can go at any time and view them. There's also a couple more webinar uh, that will come um, for the rest of the season. Here are the next three and those are the, the three for this the rest of the season. Uh, the next one is on June 2nd at Bloom Time and we'll talk about Japanese beetle management um, I will be speaking about that. We might have another topic there. Uh, we'll, we'll let you know on that. July 7th will be mid-season. Uh, we have not determined the topic, so um, we can uh, let you know at a later time. And same for August 4th at pre-harvest. We also don't have a topic, but the time and date uh, are here. The time is always at this time, 1 p.m. Central Time on June 2nd, July 7th, and August 4th. So with that, if there's no other question, I will stop sharing my screen. Is there anything that um, we need to mention here before we move on to the presentation? Okay, so you have the link here and, and now I'll give it away to Annie to talk to us about making the most of your vineyard bird management strategy. Thanks, Annie. Thank you, Christelle. All right, so um, the reason we're talking about vineyard bird management today, um, even though it's bloom, it's a very busy time in the vineyard, is because, uh, you know, last year we talked about bird management, but we talked about it in August. And once August comes around, that's actually pretty late if you're just starting to think about your bird management strategy. So this is a good time of year to be contacting the vendors um, and deciding what bird management strategy you're going to use and ordering those supplies and equipment now um, if you're ordering a net applicator, that's actually something you need to do at least six to eight months ahead of time, um, ideally by about December the year before. But so today we're going to be talking about what are the different bird management strategies. We all know about netting, um, but there are other strategies that can be used too. And we're going to talk about how those compare in effectiveness. So first off, um, for any new growers online today, um, birds matter a lot in vineyards. Birds love grapes. And specifically, the types of birds we're talking about are frugivorous birds. Um, those are birds that eat fruit. And according to our extension wildlife specialist, John, 10 minutes in a vineyard can provide a bird more fruit than two hours foraging in the wild. And so vineyards are extremely appealing to birds and they love grapes. And so, um, 
bird control is an investment, but it's a really important investment to protect your yield. There are a number of different bird control tools. So there's bird netting, of course, and then um, a lot of you have probably become a little familiar with distress call recorders or predator recorders. Um, there's also propane scare cannons and then visual deterrence, which is more of an old school uh, classical way to try to deter birds um, by using things like balloons and kites, predators, and then human activity. Simply being in the vineyard can help deter birds. There are a couple of emerging technologies, which I will touch on as well. Lasers, which is gaining in popularity a little bit. Um, I don't want to overemphasize that. I mean, there's, I think, three or four uh, farms or vineyards in Minnesota using lasers, but it's really just emerging. And then UAVs, in other words, drones, that's something that um, a couple of research groups have experimented with, but for reasons I'll get into later, that's not something that's going to get off the ground anytime soon. There are a lot of factors that impact the amount of bird pressure in a vineyard. And I think that this is just so important to acknowledge that no vineyard is identical when it comes to birds. Um, it depends on what species of birds are in your area. Uh, what is the environment like both in the vineyard and around the vineyard? Is it woods? Is it cropland around the vineyard? Um, is it plains? Uh, what's the time of day? What grape varieties you have? What are the sugar levels of those varieties? What's the foliage like um, around the vineyard? What is the surrounding vegetation? And what has the weather been? Has it been wet or has it been dry? Um, and all of these things can impact the amount of bird pressure on a vineyard and the species of birds that are around that vineyard. Um, maybe uh, a vineyard is located in an area where the dominant species of birds around are not attracted to fruit, whereas another vineyard might have a lot of fruit attracted species around. And so one vineyard might say, well, I'm able to control birds with just visual deterrence. They work great. You should think critically if someone says something like that, because you have to think about not just what works for their farm, but what might work for your farm or vineyard as well. So um, just because a tactic works for somebody, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work the same for another vineyard. And that's why there's been research comparing these strategies on multiple sites to try to tease out which ones are actually the most reliably effective. And if a technique is somewhat effective, how do you make it work the best? Okay, so the first one I'm gonna talk about is bird netting. And I'll go through some of the tips uh, to make bird netting the most successful and the, let, the least onerous as possible in the vineyard. So just a little bit about bird netting. It is still the most consistently effective method of bird control in the vineyard. Um, it's non-discriminatory for species. And so what I mean is it's just a physical barrier. And so, it, you know, it's other techniques I'm going to talk about today might work better on robins than they do on starlings. Bird netting isn't discriminating really. So it's just keeping out all of the birds equally that are nearby. Um, research has consistently found that bird netting can be more than 98% effective when used properly. Um, typically vineyards do apply and remove bird netting with tractor mounted net applicators. Um, just full disclosure, my family is uh, the, the, the family that uh, creates the netter getter, um, which is a popular piece of equipment for applying and removing net to vineyards. Um, but I'm not a commercial for netter getter. I just have a lot of experience using netting. Uh, netting is relatively expensive. You have to buy all the net on schools. You have to buy the net equipment. And then you sometimes have to replace net after a few years if the school of netting is starting to get too damaged to be effective. But since it is still the most reliably effective method, many, many growers feel that it is worth that initial upfront investment um, to install the netting system. So there's a number of tips for um, applying and using netting successfully. The first is to drape the netting loosely over the vines. Do not pull it too tightly. And what I mean by this is I sometimes see people really try to just pull that netting really snugly over the vines. And what this can do is it can actually expand the holes. Um, I'm trying to adjust my chair while I'm talking to you guys. My computer screen is way low. Um, it, so when, when you pull the net too tightly, it can actually stretch out those holes in the net. 
and it can make those holes too big. And so the, uh, the birds can actually get in through the holes. And I'll show a picture of that later. Um, sorry, can I pause for a second, Christelle? Of course. Okay, I think I need to move my computer. One second. I'm gonna stop my video here. Um, I'm having some issues with where my computer is placed. All right, so um, go ahead and turn the recording back on. I did already, go ahead. Okay. Another mistake I have seen new growers make is trying to use nets that aren't wide enough. And so the net that you buy, it actually needs to be a very wide piece of net and it needs to be wide enough that it's actually touching the ground on both sides of a high cordon trellis. Of course, if you've got a VSP trellis and you're using side netting, it's a different story. But if you're using high cordon, it's really important that the net touches the ground on both sides. And if it doesn't touch the net on both, or touch the ground on both sides, you need to have that clipped on the bottom with zip ties. Um, another uh, function of the zip ties is I've seen netting be blown away off of the vines, even if it is touching the ground, especially in very windy locations. And so securing that on the bottom with zip ties is sometimes necessary. Um, use a netting applicator. Do not attempt to do netting by hand. I just really don't recommend that unless you really just have a couple rows of grapes. Um, it's just not efficient. And that's why, for instance, the netter getter was invented is to make that uh, net application much, much, much more efficient. Um, another complaint I have heard from growers about netting is that it's uh, just a rush to get all of that netting off right before it's time to harvest because you don't wanna take the net off uh, more than a few hours before you're ready to harvest or of course you're becoming vulnerable to birds. And so uh, one thing that's important to note is if you're harvesting by hand, you don't necessarily need to get that net out of the field before you harvest if you're really tight on time. It is possible to hand harvest with the net still out in the field you can just drape it to one side of the vines or put it in a nice, um, you know, a nice neat roll uh, on the ground. Another tip is don't wear any jewelry or button up shirts while handling that. Um, don't wear earrings, especially. You can really get caught up in that net while working with it. So I'm gonna show a couple of pictures here and see if you guys can spot the netting mistakes. Um, in this vineyard, they have all of their vines on high cordon. And the mistake in this picture is not the grapes in the forefront, um, which don't appear to have netting on them. I think they'd already taken it off. The mistake is in the background. So if you look at the row behind these grapes in the forefront, you can see that even though they're using high cordon um, trellis, they do not have net that goes all the way to the ground. They have actually done some summer pruning to prune back their canopy um, in order to get that net on, which is a big no-no because we happen to know through research that if you summer prune your vines and cut back those shoots drastically before harvest, it will significantly impact the quality of your grapes um, and it can significantly impact the ability of your vines to overwinter. So that's a big no-no. Um, the other thing is since their net piece was so small, um, they actually stretched it out quite a bit to fit it over these rows. And can you see the size of those holes? Those holes are about an inch wide. And so a bird could easily peck through that. Some birds might actually easily be able to get through that net as well. Um, so a couple of big avoidable mistakes there if they had just gotten netting that was wide enough that it could touch the ground on both sides. The mistake in this picture is more obvious, as you can see. Of course, they had net that went all the way to the ground on these high cordon vines, but it had blown off on the wind and then gotten significantly ripped um, after it was blown off. And so in this case, it's a very windy site. Uh, it would have been beneficial for them to use some zip ties to secure that net around the base of some of those vines so that it wasn't going to fly around so much. Here's an example of good netting technique. Um, in this case, it is a pretty, pretty windy site, but they have never, um, this is my parents' vineyard, um, they've never really needed to clip that net at the bottom. Um, it has always just worked for them to leave it loose like that. They've got it all the way to the ground. Um, they're using this uh, flexible woven netting as opposed to the brittle plastic netting, um, but they've put it on loosely enough 
that those holes stay small, not stretched out. Um, here's an example on the left again of high cordon where the net's going all the way to the bottom. They have it clipped around the vines in case of wind. And this picture on the right is of course side netting. And in this case, why I want to show this picture is they have chosen netting that has a smaller gauge. And so those holes, um, no matter how tight you pull it, those holes are going to remain small. So, you know, some growers really don't like netting. And um, I've talked to a number of growers who are trying to explore other solutions to get away from netting. Um, so one of those possibilities is bird distress calls. Um, one example company that sells these is called BirdGuard. And so they either play artificial bird distress calls or predator calls from these automated loudspeakers um, that are set out in the vineyard to repel birds from the field. And the idea is that these sounds confuse the birds into thinking that a danger is near. And so the intent is that they will scurry away from the vineyard. Now, not all bird species react that way to danger. Some of them will actually flock together when danger is near. So this works for some species and not others. Um, another thing about these is research has found that they are effective uh, for about two to six weeks, uh, depending on the bird species and depending how frequently you are using that and varying the calls. Another technique is to use propane scare cannons um, as pictured on the right. So these, shut, these um, emit a shotgun sound. It's extremely loud every three to five, or sorry, every three to 10 minutes. They are stationary in the vineyard on poles or are just on these really short tripods directly on the ground. Um, in order for these to be effective, it's really important that you change their location as well as the interval of the gunshots um, frequently for best results. And um, you have to consider that they are very loud. So you have to consider neighbors. If you have a winery, you have to consider the winery guests as well as pets. So you may be asking, well, how effective do these distress calls in the cannons um, compared to netting? Because maybe the bird pressure on your vineyard isn't so bad that you want to consider using something maybe a little more affordable or low maintenance than netting. Um, so this, uh, this study was out of California on um, a site that had high bird pressure. Um, it's important in this research, you know, that we have high bird pressure in order to really see which ones work the best. And they found that bird netting um, only had 2.3% bird damage to the crop. Whereas when they used a combination of the bird distress calls and visual deterrents, such as kites and balloons, they got 5.7% damage. When they were only using those visual deterrents alone, they got 13% damage. And so this is just an example of a study. Um, there are a few different studies that compared bird netting to um, these other lower maintenance techniques, and they consistently found uh, that bird netting is the most effective. Again, it's just, you know, it doesn't discriminate among species um, to the extent that the others do. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a physical barrier where the others, you, you really have to be moving them around the field. Um, you can't install them too early or that, you know, that period of effectiveness might go away as the birds acclimate to it. And that's the big thing is that the birds do acclimate um, to something like distress calls or visual deterrents or cannons, uh, what happens is the birds actually over time, they start recognizing that it's not a threat because they keep hearing the sound and nothing bad is happening to them um, is basically what's going on. And so the fact that they can get used to it over time is the big factor of why they still just aren't as effective as netting. I do know of one vineyard in Minnesota that uses methyl anthranolate spray um, one product is sold by the name of Avian Guard, um, but there have been four studies on methyl anthranolate as a bird repellent in vineyards and fruit crops, um, like sweet cherries, blueberries, and grapes. Three of the studies found that it was ineffective, and one study found that it had some effect on certain bird species, but not overall. So that is obviously uh, not very reassuring, and um, because this research found it ineffective, we do not recommend using these chemical repellents for grapes. The bird scaring lasers are an emerging technology. Um, I think there's just one major company 
that sells and installs these at this point in time. I got to go watch them install a bird laser at a fruit farm a few weeks back. They were installing the laser on top of a barn, as you can see here. And so the laser, it's basically like a gigantic um, laser that you would use to play with your cat. Uh, the laser beam is just distributed either in a pattern or randomly throughout the field. And so it's, um, the fact that it is more random like that means it's harder for the birds to acclimate to it. Um, and the problem with this so far and why we're not widely recommending it at this point, even though it does seem promising, is that there really is no research on the effectiveness of bird lasers, no published peer reviewed research. Um, we have grower testimonials saying it works, but grower testimonials are not the same as peer reviewed research because there are a number of things that can um, kind of influence somebody's testimonial. So we really need to see peer reviewed research before we know what are the best practices for using this, how long are they effective, what species are they most effective on, et cetera. So hopefully we'll see more on bird lasers as time goes on. There's also been some research on uh, using drones for bird control, um, but for time's sake, I'm just gonna say this is not something that's going to be an option anytime soon. Um, the FAA, for good reason, requires you to always have a line of sight when you're flying a drone. So if you were gonna fly a drone for bird control, you would have to be out there in the field um, operating or manning that drone and watching it the entire time. Um, and you also have to do things like change the batteries out. So for something like birds, where we're having to control birds from like 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day, it doesn't make sense to use a drone. Um, there are other way more promising applications for drones and vineyards, um, such as uh, pesticide application. So in summary, bird control is a necessity on all vineyards. Bird control, or sorry, bird pressure varies depending on several factors. Netting is still the most consistently effective method, even though I know it's expensive and can be a pain to use. Um, if you're wanting to experiment with audio or visual methods, I would combine tools. Also, I wouldn't go full out on that right away. You know, keep using netting on most of your vineyard and experiment with those other tools on the other part of your vineyard to see if they're um, sufficiently effective for you before switching completely. Uh, no sprays have been found effective for bird control. And I didn't talk about mammals today, but I do get questions about that. If mammals become a problem, electric or deer fencing is still the most effective for them. Um, we did put out a new bird control uh, fact sheet recently, and I will copy that link into the chat. Um, this goes into way more detail um, than what I gave today on the topic that I was talking about. And all right, so that's it for me. Um, I'm just going to type this link in here, and then I'll right. stop sharing my screen in a second. Well, thank you, Annie. We really appreciate all the um, strategies you shared with us. And um, I think this is very helpful for people to know about how to manage bird, like you said, ahead of time and not wait for um, when you really need it. So it's really involved as far as what strategy you want to uh, apply and, uh, and how much it costs. So that's also something that people need to consider and, and spend time looking at when they're comparing strategies. Um, so we have a couple questions in the chat. The first one was from Sandy. Can netting be used in a small vineyard without machinery? So if you have a really small vineyard, you can use netting without machinery. Um, it comes on spools though. And so you basically, you roll the spool uh, on the ground down the row and you have um, one, at least one person on each side of the row pulling that netting up from the ground onto the rows. And we know that it takes a really long time to do that by hand if you don't have the equipment. <clears throat> if you just have a small vineyard, a few rows, um, you can feasibly do this. But if you have more than say, uh, depending on how patient you are, if you have more <coughs> than one or two acres, you're really gonna wanna use the equipment. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I'm coughing. <laughs> okay. Our next question is from Dale. Could you use a shorter net but clip the bottom together under the vines. Yeah, and so you saw a picture where I did that, or, or not where I did that, but where um, a vineyard did that. And um, I assume you're talking about high cordon because when you're, when you're on VSP, you're just using side netting and you're not putting that netting actually over um, the top of the canopy. So I'm assuming you're talking about um, a high cordon. And if 
your netting isn't reaching the ground, um, it's going to be really hard to get that net secure without making it too tight and expanding those holes, like I talked about. Um, because if your vineyard or if your canopy is vigorous and you're letting your shoots grow as you should, um, those shoots are going to get in the way of, of the net if the net isn't going all the way to the ground. And so uh, if your shoots are long, it, it just becomes kind of hard to, to clip it underneath. So I'm not saying you can't, you can, as long as um, you're logistically able to with the shoots in the way. Um, and as long as you're able to do that without pulling those net holes too tightly. Thank you. There's a question from Dorothy. Does color make a difference, white or green, for example? Um, not that I know of. I don't think the color makes a difference at all. And, and if they were, they probably would be dependent on the bird species. And so that would be a lot of research to determine how that would work. Mm -hmm. And the birds are most attracted by red. So I don't have any evidence or, or, or yeah. science that would suggest that they'd be attracted to like white over green. No, and, and at the same time, you're talking about uh, um, physical uh, exclusion. And so yes. we're not looking at anything that would be attractive or repellent. We're only looking at exclusion. So the color likely wouldn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Randy, but it's actually not a question, maybe a comment that came at some point that made sense, but it was to best to change the chips for different sounds it was a comment by Randy. Oh, with the, like the bird guard, yeah. the repellents. Yep, yep. Um, because you need to know what bird species you have around your vineyard. You need to know, like, are robins my biggest concern or are starlings my biggest concern or is it finches? Because then when you get your bird guard, um, you do have a lot of options of like what chips or what recordings you're playing. And so you need to make sure you're playing the recordings that are relevant for the bird species around you. And that goes back to the comment you were making earlier, Annie, about um, maybe some growers have some experience with, um, with, I think it was with the laser, for example, but, but if you have different species than what the grower you're talking to have, then, then their experience might not apply to you at all. And so that's very important, yeah. like you said, that research is conducted so that we can really know which species and what conditions you have, et cetera, et cetera. So. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, another question from Betty. When should we apply the bird netting during the growing season? Yep, so the, the best thing that you can do is apply it as soon as you start seeing verasion. So as soon as you start seeing the color change in the grapes, um, because the, uh, of course the birds are going to be more attracted to the grapes once those sugar levels increase, but they're going to start noticing them once they start seeing red berries. Okay, so this is a comment and a question maybe at the end, but I'll, I'll read it because I haven't had time to read it all. So Kevin says, I wish I had access to this information before I made all the netting mistakes I've made over the years. So I guess thanks, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about securing the net at the ground line, I added the J staples open side down and ground line to each of my wood trellis posts to attach the bottom of the nets to. I think it works pretty well to keep the nets down and in place during the wind. Okay, that's great. That's a good suggestion. Thank yeah. you. Kent says, what bird species are of concern for cold climate areas? So yeah, robins, finches, um, starlings, just to name a few. And then beyond that, um, if you talk to other growers, they will have, um, they will be able to tell you what bird species are, are a concern for their particular farms. Okay. Jake, is there a recommended brand of netting? Um, so yeah, Jake, you know, as a, as an extension employee, I can't, um, try to recommend brands. Um, but if you talk to a netting supplier, um, and there are a lot of netting suppliers, there's our, our local, um, vineyard supply company here in Minnesota and Minneapolis, um, you can talk to them and, uh, they can compare different brands with you. Um, personally, I prefer the more woven, um, flexible netting to the really uh, brittle, hard plastic netting. 
um, because I, I think it's a lot easier to get off the vines personally. Okay. Fred says, first year I will need netting. Is the netting the same size regardless of high carbon versus VSP? Um, the smaller the netting, the better uh, within reason. Um, so yeah, the size of the holes doesn't, isn't determined by whether you're doing VSP or high cordon. Um, it's just, if you get a, a smaller gauge netting, it, it's, it's probably gonna keep them out better. Um, the, the width of the netting is what changes if you're doing high cordon versus VSP, because if you're doing VSP, you put on side netting. And so um, that's only a few feet wide. If you're doing uh, high cordon, um, you know, if your cordons are six feet tall, you're going to need a net that's, you know, 12 to uh, 14 feet wide. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. This is Amaya. I just want to, you know, comment something that Annie was saying about, about the, the netting for the high cordon or the VSB. In our research vineyards at, at um, our research station here in southern Wisconsin, we had a vineyard block that had all sorts of training systems. And, and we found that actually the same netting that is long enough that covers the entire canopy that you would use for high cordon works just fine with BSP. So, and, and I actually would, I actually prefer that type of netting because it's easier to put in and out if you have an applicator. So if you're gonna invest into this and you're thinking which one to buy, it's easier to put it on as Annie was saying, depending on the quality, the ones that are more woven and they're like softer and they run faster, they're so much easier to remove and save you so much time and they're so much easier to store. So my personal preference, and I'm not endorsing any brand either, are those that you can work with using an applicator if you're gonna invest on this and that they cover the whole canopy, whether you are having a VSP or a high cordon because you can also put you can put it over the top top wire that you have in your VSP, and they work really well for our for our blocks with multiple training systems for vines. Just a comment. Thank you, Amaya. Okay, so the last question would be uh, relating to the mesh size. Is there anything that can be done to deter bees from eating the grapes? And by bees, I think this is a question from Kent, but I think you might also mean wasps. Um, because mm -hmm. both of them come at the same time at harvest. Yeah, I mean, okay, so, um, and Christelle can tell you a lot more about bees and wasps in the vineyard, but if we're talking about exclusion to keep them out, mm -hmm. that is possible. Um, I'm actually part of a research project where we're using insect exclusion netting over uh, rows of high density apple trees to completely exclude insect pests. It also excludes bees. And so we actually can't apply it until after bloom. Um, because of that. But so if you want to try to exclude wasps, mm -hmm. you could attempt that by buying insect exclusion netting, which is a lot finer, smaller gauge than um, bird netting. And um, there's a few different companies that you can uh, buy that from. But I would just, if you're trying to search, I, since I can't recommend uh, brands, I would just search um, insect exclusion netting for fruit crops and you should be able to find it there. So you have to remember that when you're trying to exclude insects, what matters is the mesh size. Mm -hmm. And then of course, how much do you want to invest in, mm -hmm. um, in excluding insects? Because like yeah. Annie's saying in orchards, that's a very commonly done in Europe, not so mm -hmm. much here. It's a big investment. So mm -hmm. you need to really invest in <clears throat> a mesh size that will exclude your insects, but also that will be uh, durable and last for years. Yeah. So something to think about. Okay, we better move on, right, to the, the other topics. Yeah, there was a question from Randy. I'll just mention it. Randy, you mentioned red grapes only, but I don't know what that related to, so that's why I'm not answering that question. So if you want to type it into the chat and be more specific on what you meant by that for red grapes, uh, we'll move on to the uh, Q&A now for, um, for weed and disease considerations. So we have two speakers today, um, but of course you have other people that are available. Um, but uh, from a disease standpoint, we have Leslie Holland from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison and Jed Cohoon, who's our weed scientist uh, for fruit and vegetable. And both of them are here to answer questions. So um, what we can do is again, continue to type your questions. And then if Leslie and Jed, you wanna come on and maybe start the conversation, uh, that would be great. 
Thanks, Christelle. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Christelle. This is Jed. Okay. So well, maybe, maybe. maybe to start the conversation, I would say, um, Leslie, to start with you, what do people need to start thinking about right now at this time of the year from a disease standpoint management, especially now that we have a lot of, uh, not a lot, but we have some rain, it's very humid. Um, and so of course, um, pathogens are gonna be very happy right now after this dry weather. Yes, that's correct. Pathogens are very happy right now. So I'm just actually dropping into the chat, as you mentioned that, Christelle, um, an article that came out, I think, last week for the Wisconsin Fruit News that I put together about some of those early season diseases. And so it seems like a lot of them, and early season sometimes is a bit of a misnomer because oftentimes those diseases can persist throughout the season if you don't manage them in the early season. That's, that's the catch. Uh, so I would say for those, the big things to be concerned about would be something like uh, phomopsis. Uh, which is oftentimes overwintering on those canes. So it'd be good to remove those as a sanitation measure. Um, something like black rot as well, if you've had uh, pressure, disease pressure in the past, that's another one that can come up at this time of year. Um, a lot of that control is actually gonna be dependent on the sanitation you would have done during dormancy, right? So removing those, those mummied uh, fruits in the vineyard. Um, two other big ones would be the mildews, right? So powdery mildew uh, and downy mildew, and again, this oftentimes depends upon disease pressure you had in previous seasons, but downy mildew is going to be coming from uh, those that leaf litter on the ground, perhaps, um, starting those, those infections, right, when you're starting to get some of that succulent tissue. A good place to potentially start seeing that, because we do have that leaf litter on the ground, would be something like a sucker, right? The spores have to splash and go up, and of course they can make it to the vines, but you might start to see earlier infections and in suckers if those are present in your vineyard. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there in case Jen wants to jump in with anything for weeds or if there's questions I'm trying to simultaneously look at the chat. Yeah, thank you, Leslie. This is uh, Jed and I apologize. I'm without video today with a poor internet connection. So we'll try audio uh, only. I have just a couple of very brief comments based on uh, recent observations from the field. Uh, in many parts of the upper Midwest, we've been through a pretty dry stretch during the time of year uh, that we were applying our early season pre-emergent dormant herbicide applications, uh, the herbicides like Chateau and Zeus and others. Uh, so the question that I get often with that is, what does it take to activate those herbicides in a very dry spring? Uh, and in rain-fed conditions, we do need some uh, activation to move the herbicide within the zone where weed seeds are germinating. Uh, these herbicides do not prevent weed seeds from germinating, but they can control weeds prior to emergence, uh, which is an important distinction because if the herbicide isn't around uh, the weed seed at the time of germination, it can't be taken up. So with that in mind, uh, this is the type of year where you want to be scouting for escapes from any dormant early spring application that you've uh, made and make plans to be able to control those. Uh, and just early this morning, I saw some of those escapes, uh, common lambs quarters coming through Chateau and such, uh, and, and other uh, pre-emergent herbicides, uh, simply because we didn't get adequate rainfall for activation in some parts of the upper Midwest. Uh, so in your post-emergent weed control plans, you'll want to consider things uh, like non-selective herbicides that are applied as a directed spray. And by a directed spray, I mean without contact uh, with the grapevine foliage or certainly flower or fruit uh, so that it's protected. And we use a lot of products, the typical uh, characters like glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup and many other trade names. Uh, that's non-selective control. That means it controls uh, broad leaves, grasses, annuals, and some perennials are, although not good perennial weed control at this time of year. Uh, the other escape that we're seeing uh, already, and this morning the observation was crabgrass. Uh, and once those annual grasses emerge, they can be uh, controlled again with a directed spray without uh, vine contact with something like POST, the herbicide POST, P-O-A-S-T, uh, or Fusilade. Uh, those are what we call post-emergent graminicides, they control grasses, uh, but not broadleaves. Uh, so just a, a note to keep in mind to 
the, we're not out of the woods, unfortunately, in terms of weed control this year. This is the type of year where you might expect to see uh, weeds escape your earlier control efforts. Uh, and scout for those early, they're much easier to control when young. Uh, and that's when we need to make a plan for that. And I think I'll uh, leave it at that. I see a couple of questions coming up in the uh, chat. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Jed, and thank you, Leslie. So the one question I see right now is from Dale. What's a good fungus spray for sulfur sensitive grapes that are also near edible crops? There we go, thanks Dale. Um, I think if you're talking about sulfur in terms of powdery mildew management specifically, because um, that's typically what it's used for, something else you could alternate with um, if that's a concern would be pristine. There's a lot of other fungicides listed in the Midwest. Actually, I put that link up as well to copy and paste. Um, that you can refer to that would also be effective against that but something if you're controlling for something like homopsis or black rot and using something like mangazeb or xyram those are not actually going to be effective towards powdery mildew so if you do have powdery mildew and those other issues you're actually going to want to include something that's a bit more effective towards powdery mildew like a pristine or a sensation or some of those uh frack groups oops and so i'm going to put that in the chat in terms of the midwest guide just so everybody has that thank you there's a question uh, from Michael over email. Is it worthwhile to spray this Saturday if we are getting a day of sun, if rain is predicted for the next three days? The timing of the spray. Yeah, that's, that's a tricky one. Um, of course, ultimately the decision is yours. I think it would dep depend on what you're spraying. Um, I think something like sulfur, right? It's just, if you're spraying that, it's just gonna wash off um, after rain. Um, I, my best recommendation for this would honestly be to look at uh, the new predictions for grape diseases in terms of what they're predicting for the respective diseases in terms of timing. It can get really tricky, so. Indeed, but yeah, working with the weather is, is the hard part in, in all of that. Um, I don't see another question in the chat, but we have an interesting question from Lizzie in the Q&A that involves everyone that does pest management. So Lizzie says, what are your thoughts on implementing complete biodiversity in the vineyard and using different plants to manage pests and diseases in the most natural way possible? Have you seen a vineyard do this successfully? So this, this is a very broad question, Lizzie, and, and it's hard to answer in a, in a quick way. Um, I think that we all agree that um, Yes, the more biodiversity you're going to have on your farm, the more likely you have to have natural, especially from an insect standpoint, natural biological control that happens. And uh, I mean, in grapes, we don't think so much about pollinators, but you still do have pollinators and they still can help in improving your yield uh, potentially. So that's something that we all agree is important to do. But as far as doing actual research, to see that every single one of them would have a different kind of um, agroecosystem that you would be looking at. So it's really hard to actually look at it from a research standpoint. Um, but there is research that, that's looking at a broader um, um, systems approach is what I'm trying to say. Um, but um, I see that Amaya, oh no, okay. Amaya was just clearing up, but I will let other people chime in on this interesting question that doesn't have a, a quick answer, of course. I'll just offer one very broad piece. And then I see Annie also has a question uh, from Michael, a follow-up that maybe uh, Amaya might like uh, regarding uh, pruning. Uh, but in terms of biodiversity, the real challenge in a holistic agroecosystem is selective biodiversity. Uh, so how do we encourage uh, beneficial uh, populations but exclude those that can become pests themselves. Uh, in my world, in weeds, for example, there are many examples of uh, unfortunate introductions of plants that are now considered terribly invasive uh, that were considered beneficial when they were introduced, but are simply too good at what they do. <laughs> and in fact, have reduced biodiversity in some cases, like uh, forestry situations that are almost exclusively garlic mustard in the under canopy that was planted uh, it, as a medicinal, medicinal and forage crop. Uh, so the selective biodiversity is the real challenge in my mind. 
Yeah, that's a very good point, Jed. Um, I guess we'll take the next question then. Um, so like Jed said from, um, from Michael that Annie passed on, um, uh, Michael is saying that if I have left too many buds because of possible frost damage, is it better to do another selective pruning now or wait and just thin shoots or drop fruit later? So Amaya. Well, it all depends on, on the on the risk of frost. Uh, I, I would I would want to say, cross my fingers, that we are past uh, at least in southern Wisconsin. I think we are past the 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 frost um, kind of alert season. Um, two things: if you left too many buds, if you have uh, if you are spur pruning and you have about ten buds between ten and five buds per spur you could go down and cut them. You're not gonna need them all. And the longer, I, I've talked about this, the longer the spur you leave, the more buds, the, the, the majority of the buds are going to break uh, on the top of that spur and those are gonna be the dominant. And so what's gonna happen if you wait to remove them, they're gonna be the bottom one in the spur, the, the basal buds in the spur that are also going to break, they're gonna be further back. So they, they're gonna take longer to develop and get to bloom and then harvest your fruit. And potentially if we have a cold season, growing season, there might be some delay in the um, ripening of that fruit. So that's one thing to consider if those spurs are extremely long. Uh, I would say that a, a way of, um, a good strategy of keeping some extra resources just in case there's a frost, and, and but not having a lot of extra buds is to leave maybe between three to four buds per spur. In that way, uh, you could anticipate that the apical buds are gonna break first and if there's a frost, those ones are gonna get damaged and then you are safe because you still have some on the base of that, of that uh, spur, but then you won't have to come back and do a lot of uh, shoot thinning. I think the problem is that or oh, at least it happens to us in our in our uh, research vineyards, which are not huge, is that things get out of control during the growing season and you never get back to doing that proper shoot thinning. So I would be more conservative with the amount of extra buds you're leaving. Um, that's, what, that's, that's my recommendation. This is, talking, this is thinking on uh, mature vines and thinking about the number of buds that you're leaving on the, uh, the spurs in the cordon. I see that there's, um, there's a question about, would it be better to leave more buds uh, as possible new trunks and cordons? I was having this conversation with, I don't remember with whom before about leaving those extra shoots that are coming from the cordon and not cleaning them on younger vines and not selecting canes right away or selecting new shoots right away at the early spring for forming cordons and trunks. My recommendation is that vines that are you know, two year old or even three year old. What I like to do is I let I like to leave everything growing. So if I have a lot of shoots that are growing from the trunk itself that I know they're not going to be cordoned because they're in a wrong position, I still prefer to leave them. First of all, because I never know how many of those canes or those shoots are going to become cane are going to survive the winter. I know how much material am I going to have to select from the following spring when I'm doing my, my pruning, my late pruning. The other reason is because I feel the more that you select and you remove points of growth, new shoots, the ones that are left that you want them to become your cordons or your trunks, they're gonna become bull kings if those new vines have a lot of vigor. And that is something that mistakes that I've learned in our research vineyards that we say like, oh, you know, we have these two or three year old vines and we have these beautiful shoots that we know we want them to be our next cordons, we're going to select them, we're going to remove the, rest, the, the rest, we're going to, we're going to focus on this. Well, you're taking all of that, you're putting all that vigor on those few little shoots and they ended up being really big and bull canes. And then next year, when you want to form those cordons, the only thing you have are bull canes and you have nothing good to work with. And so that's the other reason why I prefer to deal with the mess of letting it grow and then just select when I'm doing my, my pruning in March or, or later, if you can do it later. Thank you, Amaya. Um, Annie is gonna launch a survey right now. And while she's doing that, I would like to remind everybody that uh, the links we put at the very beginning of the chat will have the recording 
for this webinar and past webinars as well. So if you look at any of those, whether it's the University of Minnesota link or the UW uh, link, these will have the newer recording from today, but also all the past recordings and we'll have all of them at the end of the season. So you can always refer back to those sites to find those recordings. Also, we would like to remind people that are attending today that if you are a Wisconsin grower, you should talk to either Amaya, Leslie, Jed, or myself, um, depending on our expertise. And if you have questions and you're a, a Minnesota grower, you can ask Annie. And of course, she has all the, the different people that she can get um, help from. Uh, so it's not just a Annie by herself, hopefully. She gets help with all of those questions. But, um, but yeah, please uh, go back to your extension specialists uh, from your own state. Um, that helps for us in, in uh, kind of dividing up all the work. So um, and so, yeah, I, I will be um, doing the, the regular um, pop up survey um, that's just like an exit survey. Uh, but before that, Amaya and I also wanted to ask um, about who might have experienced frost or freeze damage this spring, um, because Amaya has heard a few reports of that in Wisconsin. Um, but in Minnesota, I've only had one grower approach me saying that um, they've had frost and it's obviously helpful for us to know how to help you if we have an idea of um, how bad the frost or freeze damage was in any given year. Uh, so I'm gonna um, launch that right now. You should be able to see it. And please, if, if you would, um, just tell us, did you get frost damage and uh, where you're located, what state? Thank you. And after that, I'll put up the, the regular exit poll questions. But while we're doing this, um, keep typing questions in the Q&A. Um, Amaya, while we're waiting for more questions, did you want to make a comment on uh, frost damage or anything? Yeah, I just want to show a couple of images that, that I took this morning from, from our vineyard, our research vineyard. I'll just show a couple of slides here. Um, so if I can move the poll thing out of the way here. So this is some of the damage that, that I saw on our vines. Uh, this is on Marquette, and you can see uh, in this picture, there's some of the leaves uh, have some frost damage. Uh, it doesn't look like the inflorescence have any damage. This was not the common thing that we saw, that, that I saw as I was walking the, the, the blocks. There's some way less damage. You can see here a little bit of damage in the leaves, but either that damage, that the, the shoots are going to recover. This, this shoot is going to be just fine. It's going to continue to grow. And, and you can see those inflorescence. It doesn't look like there's much damage. Those, those flowers are still pretty close. I mean, the, those probably did not have any damage. If they would have had damage, you would have started seeing them getting um, sort of like really dark brown and, and, and black in a couple of days. So it, we didn't see a lot of damage there. And I just want to show a couple of other pictures that I call it. So this, this is absolutely recovered. The, the vines will recover for that minimum damage. Uh, and here you can see some damage, some others that look just fine. Uh, very, very spotty, the amount of damage that I saw. Uh, a lot more on uh, the VSP than on the high quadrant. Uh, when I say a lot more, I saw more of this type of spotty damage on the VSP, and that makes makes sense because those cordons are a little bit lower, uh, and that difference, yeah, um, that high difference can be maybe two or three degrees difference in temperature, which can result in damage to no damage at all if you compare the two cordons. What I want to show is this picture. I think that we talked with Annie on previous on previous webinars about pruning and the basal buds that we don't count them in uh, our spurs. So in this case, this spur, we left um, one bud that broke, one basal one that is the union of the, the shoot that grew last year with the previous. But look at all of this that is here. So when people say like, should we leave way more buds? Well, if you leave a lot of buds, if you leave a spur that has you know five buds, and in addition, you're gonna get all of these, it's gonna be a lot of work for shoot thinning. So that's Part of the things that, that we see, uh, this thing is uh, this is in, in a Marquette vine. So very, very common to see this. We struggle a lot with these to ha afterwards have to remove all of this extra growth. So those are the, stop sharing what I wanted to. Okay, so let's look at the poll. So the first question is, 
Did your vines experience frost or freeze damage this spring? Uh, we have four responses of 12% saying yes, severe frost damage. 33% yes, mild frost and 55 no. 42% uh, of the people that responded were from Wisconsin. And I would assume that that is mostly uh, Southern Wisconsin. So let's talk a little bit about um, what can we do about the frost damage? And this is where kind of like, I, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in here as well. It kind of, there's, there's, we don't have a lot of things to do to protect our grapes from frost. And this is, you know, kind of like the unfortunate thing that we have to deal with is that we don't have anything magical that we can spray that we can protect them yet. There are new research going on on products, different types of products, whether they are products that will, um, Delay bud break. That's a very promising product that's being tested right now. There's a couple of other products that are going to come into the market that work as um, sort of like an insulation, like a layer of insulation that they spray on the buds or on the developing new shoots, and they cover them and they help them with um, just protect them a couple of degrees. And those are new products that said that they will appear in the market in the next couple of years. Right now, the only alternative that we have is to use wind machines, which is not affordable for small growers. If, you know, any of the big growers might be able to afford one of those, but that is not something that is economically viable for, for many of you folks that are attending today. The other thing that I wanna talk about is what can we do now that we have that damage? So we know that we will have the secondaries breaking. And that sets up a lot of other challenges about how to deal when you have a mix of primaries and secondaries, in which we know that the secondaries might be delayed in their development, never catch up, and that fruit might be a little bit uh, further behind, and they're not gonna have the same amount of bricks and TA as the ones from the primary. What I think is the best thing to do in this case is in anticipation of not knowing what type of growing season we're going to have is canopy management. Proper opening those canopies, doing leaf removal to make sure that the clusters that are behind from secondaries have a chance to ripen as fast as possible. And the only way that you're gonna be able to do that is by uh, open the canopy, doing leaf removal and increasing the interception of light into those secondary those clusters in those secondary shoots that are a little bit behind. The other drastic thing that you can do, depending on how much damage you have, is just go ahead and decide to go with the secondaries and remove the primaries uh, or the other way around. I think that if we have a relatively warm growing season, sunny growing, growing season, those secondary, those clusters in secondary shoots should be able to catch up. Uh, the issue is going to be if we have a very rainy, cold, like the day we have today in Wisconsin, uh, in Madison at least, growing season in which we're not gonna have enough growing degree days to push those clusters to um, ripe as fast as possible. Annie, I don't know if you have any, any comments or any suggestions for growers that have a lot of damage on what else they could do. One thing that I wanna say though is no fertilizer is going to solve your problem. So no extra fertilizer, no nitrogen, no nothing, no micronutrients are going to help you get those uh, fruits to ripen early or at the same time as the fruit that are going to be in the primary shoot. Uh, so that, that's not the solution. Well, thank you, Amaya. I think I just wanna make sure that for people that wanna leave now, it's two o'clock, so we're at the end of our time. So feel free to go now. Thank you for filling out the exit evaluation. Uh, we really appreciate and we're glad to see that you learned things today that you will implement. And uh, Annie, if you wanna say anything, please feel free to do so. I just yeah. want to let people go if they wanted to. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, um, and if I, I have another question for Leslie as well. So if people wanna um, stick around, you can, but if you need to go, you're more than welcome. Um, but I was going to say before people go, if there was something you were hoping we were going to talk about in today's webinar, um, but you didn't hear it, make sure you go back to last year's webinars around this time. We did two different webinars in May that answered a lot of questions about things to do in your vineyard around bud break, um, such as uh, fungicides. We went into detail on that. Um, 
and we went into detail on planting vines. So if you wanted to hear about planting today, um, go back to the, the U of M Extension Small Farms YouTube page, which we linked to at the beginning, and you're gonna find um, a lot of information on that there. Um, Leslie, my question was, okay, so in Minnesota, we've actually been extremely dry the last couple of weeks. Um, the first rainfall we had in the Twin Cities in a long time was last night. And so because it has been so dry, can growers um, spread out their spray intervals instead of doing seven days? Can they extend it out to more like um, 10 to 14 if we keep being so dry and there just aren't opportunities for fungi to reproduce? Yeah, I, I would think so. I think, yeah, the dryness um, sounds like every year is different. Wisconsin, I'm still learning myself. Uh, but yeah, having that, that the dry weather is really going to help because you don't have the rain, which is for most of the diseases I previously mentioned, that's how those fungal spores are getting and moving anywhere. If you don't have the vehicle for the spore to go anywhere, then that disease pressure is going to be a lot lower. Okay. And can you comment on powdery mildew? So to me, powdery mildew is a little unique from some of our other diseases because uh, you know, coming from somebody who's not a plant pathologist like you are, I, I feel like basically, you know, it's stimulated by rainfall and humidity, but then um, it needs drier conditions to keep, uh, to keep reproducing during the season. Is that, is that right? So what if we have a really dry season this year? Should we be looking out more for powdery mildew? So actually powdery mildew tends to kind of hide in those humid areas kind of in the canopy. And actually, if you're getting a lot of sun exposure, uh, that's not gonna be great for powdery mildew. And in fact, that's really, if we think about the basis for a lot of the new research coming out for that UV light controlling powdery mildew, mm -hmm. right? We're getting UV from the sun. So anytime it's in that direct sunlight, as you're opening up your canopy, some of that benefit is going to be to help manage your, your powdery mildew. So, um, so I would say humidity is much more of a factor than rain would actually be with powdery mildew. So awesome. trying to minimize that microclimate that might occur in your canopy is going to be um, the best way to culturally control that. So. Great. Great. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much, everybody. I think we're going to end here. Um, we really appreciate um, everybody joining us and the presenters. Uh, this has been very useful, we hope, for everybody. Um, again, check out the recordings if you miss something or have any uh, questions that you missed the answer to or anything like that. So uh, with that, we will um, say bye and see you at our next meeting, which I believe is June 2nd. So uh, next webinar. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.